the topic for today uh, is direct EV5. What is the difference between direct? And I'm going to pitch this at all levels. That would be, um, I will pitch this both at the advanced and the entry level. So I apologize to those of you who are experienced EB5 practitioners. Uh, this is going to include some basic information, but the purpose is to provide you with a framework of how this exactly works. How does direct EB5 work? And why am I not dealing with the regional center program? Well, because the regional center program expired on June 30th. I am expecting it to be renewed, but I can't tell you when. It could be weeks. It could even be months. What I'm personally expecting in terms of the regional center program is that we will get an extension up until September 30th, during which time Congress will debate a substantive bill. But I am also hopeful because I know that there is a bill ready besides the Grassley bill that could in fact be enacted very soon. There's talk about attaching it to the infrastructure bill or spending bill. We claim to be a top rated firm. Uh, the proof of course is in the results. So let's move on. Um, there we have Patrick, managing partner of Visa Franchise. Uh, VisaFranchise.com. Um, I think Patrick is probably the most seasoned guy in the industry today. Um, and he is extremely well established, but he will present separately after me as soon as I've gone through this. Standard legal uh, disclaimer with a typo in there. Uh, I should have fixed that, uh, um, James. Um, this is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, you need to consult with a specialist. Briefly explaining for the beginners what the EB-5 process is. The first thing is to prepare the source of funds, select the appropriate project, file your I-526 petition. The bad news is those are taking two to three years to adjudicate. Then you land with your green card, and you have a conditional green card, 21 months later after landing, you get to file your 829, which is the removal of conditions. And it's at this final stage that you have to prove that the jobs were timely created and that the capital was committed, but you need to commit the capital at the time of filing the 526. How long does all of this take, assuming you're not from a backlogged country? Realistically, minimum five to six years from start to finish. If you're from a backlogged country, you can add as many years as necessary because currently um, wait time estimates are running several years for Chinese. Uh, India hasn't been hit yet. Vietnam has, but that number, I'm not gonna get into any depth on waiting lines today, other than um, those numbers will change and do change every year. The Chinese waiting line first emerged in 2015 and has been a huge headache for persons born in China. The Vietnam waiting line, we're going to talk about has actually moved quite nicely, but um, currently we have a cutoff of April 2020 for Vietnam, which is really quite reasonable. Um, and the Vietnamese market is getting strong again, um, together with the Indian market, which uh, has not yet seen the backlog, but will. Um, why am I talking about that? In this chart, it says, in small print underneath the 526, wait for the priority date to become current. And there are those three countries, India, Vietnam, and China, that becomes a significant issue. So why am I talking about EB-5 Direct? I'm talking about EB-5 Direct because there is no regional center filing as of today. 
I expect this to change within a matter of weeks, but if somebody instructs me to file an EB5-526 today, I cannot file unless it is a direct EB5. What is the difference between direct and regional center? There is one critical difference. Direct means 10 full-time jobs, 35 hours a week, full-time employees, US workers, primarily citizens, and US residents. For indirect EB-5, you can use indirect jobs based on economic models. So we don't have 10 actual employees, we basically have an expenditure model that if you spend a certain amount of money that is deemed to be the equivalent of at least one job. So for obvious reasons, over 95% of EB-5 has been regional center. But that program, which was first started in 1992, has been a temporary program requiring extensions. And we've had 17 or 18, sorry, I lose count. So we've had extensions for over 30 years. Congress went on vacation without extending this year. Has this happened before? Yes, in 2018. How nervous am I about the extension? Well, I'm nervous about everything. But I am convinced that with 10 to $20 billion invested in the regional center program, Congress is not gonna let this program die. Um, there has been a debate over the Grassley bill. Some people, including myself, feel the Grassley bill does not solve the problems in EB-5. We all support immigration reform. We understand the need to reform the program. That's not the problem. The problem with the Grassley Bill is it doesn't provide solutions. All right, let's dive into some EB-5 basics here. Program was created in 1990, 10,000 visas a year, 500,000 investment or $1 million. Well, let's turn it around. It's $1 million reduced to 500,000 if you are in a targeted employment area. You create 10 full-time jobs and the investment has to be sustained. I explained that already, so let's jump on. These are your general requirements. You have to engage in a new commercial enterprise. This is not a word or a phrase. It's important. When you invest in an existing business, it's a completely different framework and inevitably there will be problems. So one of the reasons I invited Patrick to this is that Patrick specializes in franchise in new businesses. So whenever we have a new commercial enterprise or a new franchise, you're in good shape. If you buy an existing one, well, the job's already there. So where's the job creation? It starts getting complicated. The only exception is if you're buying a troubled business and in which instance you can save the 10 jobs, but even there it's problematic. My advice is always start a new business ground up from the beginning. There were no jobs to start off with. And now you can show your 10 full-time US workers 35 hours a week. So very heavy emphasis on a new petition. By the way, we do have a chat column. Um, those of you who uh, have questions, please keep them short. I'm going to try and get through all of your questions. If not, you can always email me afterwards, bernard at wolfsdorf.com. I'm pretty good with responding to emails, usually within 24 hours. It's my name with the at sign and Patrick's email. Uh, we gave it out. We'll give it out again. And you Patrick reach... at visafranchise.com. Well, there we got it. So Patrick at visafranchise.com. Um, Patrick's a good guy. He uh, works with his brothers, and they are all very knowledgeable in this arena. But again, I always use the word due diligence. Do due diligence, and then when you're done, do more due diligence.
do due diligence on your lawyers, see who you're working with, check out their track record, and individually make sure that your investment is safe. Because one of the requirements for the EB-5 program is the investment must be at risk. You cannot make a passive investment. Everybody wants to get into, <coughs> pardon me, real estate. Well, real estate is good. I understand that. But where are you creating the 10 jobs? How are you creating 10 full-time jobs from a $500,000 real estate investment? I don't see it, but I want to be open-minded and hope that I'm wrong. Uh, I like to be proven wrong. All right. So what else? I-526 petitions. I mentioned that we need 10 full-time jobs. The investment has to be at risk. Actually, need to go back to this. The investor must also be engaged in the management of the enterprise. So one of the big differences between regional center, where there's limited engagement, for a direct, we do need you more hands-on. We want to show... A, that you are qualified to manage the business, and B, that you are managing the business. So I, I want to focus on that a little bit, is does this person speak English? If they don't speak English, how are they going to manage the business? Are they going to work through a manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we do have a stronger management, hands-on management requirement for the EB-5 direct. Um, moving forward, the current investment amount is a million dollars. It's always been a million dollars. It was set at a million dollars in 1990. What, the re what has happened, which is why we're doing this webinar, is that a regional center by the name of Bering, B-E-H-R-I-N-G, sued the government on the November 2019 regs which Trump enacted, increasing the minimum investment amount from 1 million to 1.8. And for regional center and direct TEA down to 500,000, the regs had pushed them to 900,000. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is a month ago, the minimum amount for an EB-5 investment was 900000 Today, the minimum investment amount for EB-5 is 500000 When has it ever happened that a government program reduces the amount of the investment by, what is that, 80%? The bottom line is we have a window of opportunity to file EB-5 direct tomorrow or today at 500,000. We don't know how long this is gonna last. In fact, you can be sure that the government, either through regulation or statute, is gonna push the number back up. Why? How do I know that? Because Ali Mayorkas, our DHS secretary, has already put a statement into the court saying that he feels it should be at the higher amount. They tried to fight to support the Trump regulation, but they lost. They might appeal. How long will the $500,000 last? Nobody knows. Is the $500,000 investment available today? Yes. Will it be available tomorrow? I think so. How about next week? Probably. How about next month? I don't know. How about the month after? Nobody knows. So what I do know is we have a heavily discounted program as of today, which is why I'm doing this webinar. Because there are clients out there and investors out there who want the discounted price. How long will it be available? I've already tried to answer that. Will it be available next year? I doubt it. Will it be available in October, I doubt it. September, maybe. But we have a narrow window. So if you have investors 
I would love to tell them, hold off for the regional center program enactment, but I don't know if they're going to be able to get that at 500. I do know that they can get the direct program at 500,000. There isn't a lot of product available right now. Even talking to Patrick, they've had to put some product together. But since they've been very active in the E2 arena, they pretty much already set up with, and we will hear what he has to offer. I have no idea what Patrick's going to tell us today. So I'm also interested in listening and learning. Targeted employment area. All right, TEA. This is confusing. What does the TEA do? It reduces your investment amount. So I normally say, describe it as a high unemployment area. The rural is quite difficult. You think, oh, we're rural less than 20,000. Well, there's a second leg. It also has to be outside a metropolitan statistical commuting area. So the combination of under 20,000 also requires outside an MSA, and that really limits the number of rural options available. But if you're in a rural, then it's 500,000. And pretty, it's pretty different between the states, right? Like I've seen in Florida for some clients, it being pretty easy, where Texas is kind of a pain. You got it right, Patrick. Um, basically, one of the things that happened in the November 2019 regulations is the government took away the ability of states and local uh, authorities to determine a TEA. That's been knocked down. So right now, the state of California is back in the business of defining the TEA. They haven't actually retooled yet. They're not officially issuing them. But we have a pretty good idea where the TEAs are. There are good TEA markets. Scratch that. There are TE, good TEA maps. We can point you to. Um, give us the address. Give us the tract TRACT number. And we can usually tell you whether or not there's a T, that's a TEA or not. And if you're in a TEA, that means you have a high unemployment rate, 150% of the national average. Your investment amount is 500,000. I normally describe them as bad areas. They're not necessarily that bad. It says submit a letter from the state's agency. And as Patrick correctly pointed out, some states are very good at this. Some are not. That's not your problem. Getting the TA letter, I'll connect you with the right people. That's part of our job. We will work on that and resolve that for you. I see questions are coming in. Please keep them short so we can answer all of them. But the bottom line, again, is to reduce from a million dollars down to 500,000, you need to be in a TEA. I mentioned this point, the investment must be at risk. You can't put it in a bank account. You have to deploy it into job creating activities must be an equity investment and it must be personal funds. If your corporation makes the investment, there are situations where we can handle loans. We prefer gifts, unsecured loans. I know there's the Zhang case. The Zhang case was our case, but we are still going conservative on this. Invest your own money. Or if you're going to use a loan, make sure it's secured by your own personal assets. I already spoke about buying a business or starting a new business. The 10 employees must be W-2 employees and generally should be citizens or permanent residents. Yes, we can take asylees and refugees. No, we cannot take DACA kids. So if I'm doing the EB-5 direct, I want every single I-9, that's the form you complete when you hire someone, I want you to send it to me. I want to verify it's done correctly because I have a friend who filed an EB-5 with 11 people, two of them were undocumented, and the case was denied. I mentioned the regional center program sunset on June 30th. I think it's going to get extended soon, but I can't say when. The direct program does not expire. It is permanent, and we are open for business today. 
For that reason, direct is popular as of today. Okay, lawful source of funds. This is a one-hour topic, so I'm going to keep it short. We, we prefer business earning, salary, gifts, secured loans. We like personal tax returns. We like audited financial statements. Nobody has them, of course. But we work with you in terms of preparing the source of funds. So, Bernie, like a secured loan, if someone doesn't want to sell their, their stock in Apple, they could take a loan against that stock and use it for EB-5? Um, I'm going to basically say I'm not going to give clear answers to any loan sure. situations right now. I'm going to ask you to send in your proposal and we'll have a look at it and study it. My partner, Vivian Zhu, is the guru in this area. Basically, what happened is in the Zhang case, the court said cash is cash, um, but there is still a negative attitude towards unsecured loans. You're talking about a potentially secured loan on stocks. That's kind of, uh, I'd rather go with a mortgage. What is the value of your stock? If your stock drops below the value of the loan, then we have a problem here. What if your stocks are one third, only worth 100,000? They're not adequately secured. So I'm having a problem with that. So I don't want to go into weeds on that, but um, let's, let's, dive into some of the more basic issues. Um, job creation. I-9s, W-2, tax returns. The big question is when. At the time we file the 526, I do like to have two or three employees. The way this works, however, is that if you don't have 10 employees at the time you file, you must have a matter of whole business plan. Matter of whole business plan is critical. Your case will be denied if you don't submit one. And the bottom line with the matter of whole business plan is that it shows that the project will have a need for at least 10 minimum employees. But you have to also show the approximate dates of when these employees will be hired. So here's what happens in the real world. You file the 526 petition, the government sits on it for two years, they issue an RFE and then they say, show me the jobs. And you're like, well, wait a second, my guy can't come in with a green card until he's landed. How do you expect him to have the jobs? Well, they're not sympathetic. So their attitude is hire a manager, hire the employees. We don't care that you couldn't come in. So there's the government being mean to us but I'm telling you, make sure you have those jobs. So the business must describe the current employment levels and the projected new jobs. We need details of the jobs, the job title, job description. I probably won't get into this in too much depth, but for those of you who want to do EB-5, Read item 13, slide 13. Very, very important. This is another important slide, the characteristics of a direct investment. 100% parent. So if the job creating entity has a parent company and that parent company only owns 70%, of the JCE, you've got a problem. So the structure has to be very simple. If you're gonna have a parent company, it has to be a 100% owner of the job creating entity. So the new commercial enterprise, let's call it the holding company, has to have 100% ownership of the job creating entity, the entity that actually hires the individuals. Moving on to the advantages. Well, simplicity is definitely there. The regional centers, we've had situations where regional centers have gone bust. We've had situations where regional centers involve fraud. What happened to the poor investor? Well, they got kicked in the pants. That's what happened. How long does it take to set up a regional center? Try a year, year and a half, maybe two years. So 
one of the advantages of direct is simplicity. You basically set up a company, you invest a million or half a million, you hire 10 full-time workers, US workers, and you get your green card. If the business fails, you're in trouble. So make sure the business doesn't fail. In terms of geographic diversity, well, the only issue you have is if you want to be at the lower amount of 500,000, you have to be in a TEA. But since it's your own money, maybe you'll invest a million dollars anyway, because it's going to be very hard to create 10 jobs with 500,000, and you don't have to go into a high unemployment or rural area. So you can choose your area, but in that instance, it's a million. You say, well, Bernie, what's the big deal? I get a million dollar investment. Why, is it, why, why are you doing this webinar? Well, as of two weeks ago, it was 1.8 million. So the million dollars is a huge discount. For those who are not as high net worth, it's reduced from 900 down to 500. But for the regular EB-5, it was 1.8 million being reduced down or back to 1 million. So it seems like a pretty good deal. Now, pool direct investment. This is absolutely permissible. I'm not sure if Patrick has dived into this, but here we have a situation where maybe five people put a million bucks each. We have to create 50 jobs. Maybe one of them doesn't want a green card. We only need 40 jobs with 5 million. So this is where a group of investors gets together. And obviously, you have more leverage in terms of what you can do. Some businesses, million dollars, going to be a small business. So pool direct investment is potentially problematic. Did I say potentially problematic? Potentially viable. So what about buying using a pooled investment to buy a troubled business? Again, the number one issue is, has this business lost 20% of its net income during the preceding two years? Well, how many businesses have lost 20% of net income during the preceding two years? Is it 50% of American businesses? For those of you who are entrepreneurial, look at the opportunities here. There are so many troubled businesses. But again, do your due diligence. I mean, who wants to invest in a troubled business? I don't know. But driving around Santa Monica yesterday, I saw there were tons of businesses that have closed down. So the potential to invest in a troubled business, resurrect, is tremendous. And here we don't have to hire 10 new workers. We are merely securing the jobs of the previous employees, saving jobs. I spoke a little bit about this management concept. Some people will argue that it's the same as a regional center. My feeling is the individual has to be a little bit more hands-on, but a limited partnership will work from a structural point of view. Exit strategies, well, this is more complicated, but until such time as the 829 or removal of conditions has been approved, I would caution against exiting or seeking to exit. As for providing a new commercial enterprise, if you look at the rules, when they say if you buy an existing business and you expand the net worth or number of employees by 40%, you're okay. Not true. The regulations are terrible. 40% expansion does not mean you're safe, you have to basically create 10 new jobs in addition to the 48% expansion, and you have to reorganize and restructure the business 
such that there's a new business. This is the biggest headache I have with direct. People call me and say, I just bought a business. And I say, well, are you going to reorganize, restructure, and create a new business? They say, of course I am, but they don't. So you really have to change the fundamental nature. I am very nervous about touching any EB-5 case where people are purchasing existing businesses. So proving that it's new is huge. This is the problem of multiple TEAs. The business has to be principally located within the framework of the TEA. I already mentioned that they cannot sell or refinance prematurely. That can impact the business. The other thing about EB-5, which is kind of stupid, is that until the individual has their green card, meaning that until they've landed with the green card, material changes are not allowed. So you have a business plan. In business, we always make changes to accommodate the needs of our clients in the economy, but they don't allow that. It's kind of stupid. Once you have your green card, however, then change to the business can be made. But this kind of silly rule, but you better follow it. These are the issues you need to be aware of. The amount of the investment, is it a million? Is it half a million? Have you got adequate jobs to create? What is the future of the EB-5 program? Well, for direct, it's simple. For regional center, we need to wait for the enactment. When to file? Well, that's the issue of have you invested the full amount? My view is I would consider a partial investment, but only if the funds have been identified and we are seeking to transfer them. So if, for example, the money is coming out of India and we can only bring out a certain amount every year, but we've got it in a bank account and it's but for currency regulations, the full amount would have been invested. But there's, there's danger that the case would be denied or rejected because the full amount hasn't been invested. What about quota regret, retrogression? Well, for Chinese, we definitely have a big problem multiple year wait. For Vietnamese, it's got a little bit better. For India, it's still going to hit us on the head. What about processing times? At the moment, the government's taking over two years to get a 526 petition approved. Another six to 12 months before you get interviewed. So realistically, from the time you start until you land, based on current processing times, close to three years. Then you've got a two year wait. Now we up to five years. And then you file your 829. Those are also taking two or three years. Now you're up to seven or eight years. So this is a huge commitment. In almost every instance, your money is going to be irrevocably committed for a long, lengthy period of time, usually at least eight years or longer. You need to be managing the business. You need to be qualified to manage the business. How long will it take for conditions to be removed? Redeployment mainly applies in the regional center context. Now, Patrick does about 10 or 12 E's every month. Patrick is very well established with the E's. Now, one of the big questions when you do an E is, is that lawyer thinking about EB-5? Is the lawyer thinking about TA issues? Do they have adequate source of funds? This is the problem. People come to me with an E and say, I invested five years ago. And I'm like, all right, let's do the source of funds. We can't prove where the money came from. Or well, the money came from a corporation, not from an individual. No EB-5. In which case, I'll tell them, sorry, we can't convert that E2 to EB-5. We have to start a new business. So did the money come from the individual or did it come from the company? We have the issue of the business plan. Were the jobs already created by the time you put the money in? Starting a new company versus acquisition of a new company, I've already answered. 
I like to start a new company. So uh, importance of consular processing on form I-526, that's a minor technical issue, but it's an important one because the E-2 is a temporary visa. So I get this question all the time. If I file for EB-5, can I renew my E-2? Well, it depends. You still have to show that you have an unrelinquished domicile abroad for an E-2, provided you don't indicate that you plan to adjust in the US. In almost every case, I believe we can show temporariness on an E-2, even though we filed for an EB-5. So this, there's, there's quite a few tricks to converting an E2 to an EB-5. There's quite a few rules that need to be followed. Purchasing a troubled business. I mentioned that I think there's potential here. How do you find the troubled business? I can't say I'm going to recommend any business brokers it takes it takes one to two years according to harvard business review to find and do a due diligence on the right business wow like an existing business so, so there time. you there you go um it takes less time to sell on average you sell a business in less than six months but to buy an existing business one to two years and i i would say that that is really good advice patrick um do due diligence, people buy existing businesses and then they find it doesn't work. But if you do qualify and you can find one, we need a loss of 20% in the net worth prior to the loss. So 20% decrease in the net worth. I think that there are a lot that are going to qualify, but finding a good one and must maintain no less than the pre-investment level of employees. So if you had 15, you've got to keep 15. If you had nine, I don't think you're going to qualify. So purchasing a troubled business may be an option. I think I'm going to pass on that. Rules for the employees. Now, job sharing is allowed. It's complicated. You need to have clear contract, but two part-time jobs doesn't equal a full-time job. Bernie, what you said sounds inconsistent. I know, but we can structure it such that job sharing is permissible, but part-time jobs are not. When do the jobs have to be created? Well, that's not never quite clear. Do the jobs have to exist for five years? No, possibly two years. Here's what I can tell you. At the time we filed the 829, I must have 10 full-time employees. Finished. I must have 10 full-time employees as verified by I-9s, W-2s, tax returns, etc. At the time we file the removal of conditions, which is three or four years down the road. Do we need to have 10 at the time we file the 526? No. Would it be nice? Yes. Do we need to have two or three? I like to see some employees initially. All right. Some of the other problems, if the individual's in the US on a B visa, they can't really manage the business. They can set up the business. If they have an E2 country passport, 81 countries, I believe, then they can do it on an E2. If they don't, we can talk about acquiring a second passport. The Grenada passport is very popular. The Turkish passport, also about 250,000. Grenada passport's cheaper. And with those passports, you can get an E2. And then that would allow you to come in within a few months 